Hi, my name is Rachel Chu, and I'm the Communications Director at the Millennial Institute. We're here today with Alejandra Campoverdi. She is running for the U.S. House of Representatives in an election that will take place on April 4th. Alejandra, thanks so much for being with us. Oh, thank today. you for having me. Thank you. <laughs> so really quickly, just tell us about yourself. What experiences and events um, growing up and in your career led you to want to run for Congress? Absolutely. You know, for me, the personal and the professional is very much linked, and that's what led me here. So I'm going to go way back, if that's okay. Basically, for in my experience, I was raised by a single mother, and she was an immigrant from Mexico. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there were eight of us in a three-bedroom in my childhood, and so at times we were on welfare, we took WIC, you know, we had to be on Medi-Cal, Medicaid, you know, and I went to school on student loans and financial aid and Cal grants, you know. So it was been, it's been a whole process of learning about these issues in a very first-hand way before I even got into politics and learned about the policy issues in that way. They're not theoretical for me is what I'm trying to say. You know, I'm here in Los Angeles in the 90s going to high school, what really catalyzed me to get into public service in the first place was Proposition 187. So 187 was one of the kind of granddaddy laws of the anti-immigrant laws. And what they wanted to do was strip social services away from undocumented immigrants and their children. And hearing the rhetoric in Los Angeles at that time, when it was Rodney King and OJ and the LA riots, everything was very charged around race. And it really shocked me because I came from an immigrant family and I recognized the contributions of immigrants to our society. And hearing people described so one-dimensionally, not just immigrants, but Latinos in general, was, was something that really catalyzed me into wanting to do something different and to make sure that these stories were told by the communities themselves. So after high school, I went to USC, and I studied um, at Annenberg School for Gen Journalism and Communications. And when I graduated, I went to the California Endowment, which is a healthcare organization. And what it is that they did at this foundation was they give grants to migrant farm workers to help them access health and human services. So when I left there, I went to Harvard to the Kennedy School of Government, because I really wanted to think about policy as it affects systems and policy change. When I graduated from Harvard, it was 08. And all I wanted to do was find a way to put these policies that I learned into action. So I joined the Obama campaign in Chicago. But, you know, like a lot of folks, I had to live off my credit cards and figure out how to make ends meet in that way to work on a campaign. Now, granted, I had just come out of Harvard where I went to school 100% on student loans. So I understand how crippling it is, the kind of debt that a lot of times we have to take on, especially when we're one of the first in our families to be able to go to college. But in order to do that, we don't want to pass up that opportunity, right? So instead, we take on these loans that we're going to be battling for the rest of our lives many times. I, I'm still well away from paying them off. But you know, going back to being on the Obama campaign, living off my credit card, went 16 grand in credit card debt, but it was worth it. You know, it was something, and it was a moment in time where I really found someone whose vision for the country I believed in. When we won, I went to the White House with President Obama, where I worked for the first four years, the first two years in the Chief of Staff's office, and then I became Deputy Director of Hispanic Media, where I got to travel with the President to Latin America and really experience what it was like to be engaged with the Latino community at the highest level of government. I went to Univision Next to launch the television network Fusion. And then I came back to Los Angeles because for me, this is home and this is where I wanted to bring all my experience back to benefit this community, namely now California's 34th Congressional District. I came to the LA Times and I worked with Jose Antonio Vargas, who I don't know if you're familiar with, the undocumented journalist um, who outed himself in the New York Times Magazine. And so I worked with Jose as managing editor of an immigration, race, and identity platform to talk about the emerging new American identity because again, Without these stories about our communities, you know, we are many times left out of the conversation or misrepresented of who we are. And I think it's very important to elevate these voices in media because media and policy, as we know, they, they operate hand in hand. So, you know, we, that gets us to this last election and when President Trump was elected, it was a real flashpoint moment for me, similar to Proposition 187, where I thought, okay, here is this position that is up now in my district and if I'm really serious about wanting to do something, which a lot of young people were thinking at the same time, and really put my money where my mouth is about pushing back against this disastrous policies, I'm going to step up and run for office. That, as well as the fact that a lot of things that I worked on, especially at the White House, like the Affordable Care Act, were under siege. And so those were the two things that made me realize that I need to take where I come from and where I've been and put them together to work for my community.
Great, and I'm so glad you brought up the Affordable Care Act. Um, I actually know that you have, you know, publicly commented on the health issues and the way breast cancer has affected members of your family. Um, as if you were elected to Congress, what are your things that you will do to kind of fight for the ACA and protect Obamacare? Absolutely. Look, we the fight is already starting now, and these are things that I'm already doing now. And to your point, my first ad, and let's go further back than that. You know, revealing this thing about myself. That's one of the first steps because we need to bring this conversation back to people because that's what this is about. You know, there's a lot of like 30,000 feet conversations going on about health care and all these projections of how many people are going to be affected. But let's talk about the real life implications and remind people that lives are at risk. And so I hadn't told more than a handful of people about my own um, BRCA positive um, gene mutation status. That isn't something I shared with more than maybe five or six people, including my mother for about six months after I found out. It's very personal and I'm a very private person, but the reason I decided to come forward with that is because I'm one of the lucky ones. You know, I have this information, I have health care right now, and I'm able to make a decision to do something preventatively, which is what I'm going to do, have a preventative surgery to lower my breast cancer risk. But women all over the country, women and men, but as, as it pertains to breast cancer as well, you know, need to have the capacity to A, have screenings for genetic mutations so they have this information and can empower themselves, but also be able to have access to the preventive services that are the mammograms that they're doing, that are the blood tests in order to check their hormone levels, the MRIs that are necessary. All of this is under siege because people are making it so that you can discriminate against potentially for having a pre-existing condition or all the low-income folks and seniors that are potentially at risk of losing their health care, but then if you don't have continuous coverage, you're given a penalty, so then how are you ever supposed to surpass that if it's already hard enough for you to be able to afford health care in the first place? And so to me, it seems like a complete cycle that is going to be just leading to more and more people getting sicker and getting penalties and not being able to access care, so they're getting sicker and getting penalties, and it seems like our community, and I know that this community is going to be one of the ones that suffers the most. So there will be no more vocal advocate for Obamacare and for holding on to the progress we've made and improving upon it because there's always improvements that can be made, but we've already made progress that we cannot let go of. Cool, very cool. Um, we have one last question. So at the Millennial Institute, we were founded on the idea of decreasing voter apathy and increasing voter turnout among millennials. What is something that you want to say to voters? Why should young people vote, especially um, on April 4th? Absolutely. Well, maybe I'll say this directly to them. You know, one of the reasons why people, young people need to vote is because as we've seen this past election, your vote means more than ever before. But I want to take it one step further because we've been saying that for a while. Not only do you need to vote, but you need to run for office. And this is something that I've really come out strongly on this past week and written about myself because when we're looking at this next generation, we need young people. We need young people of color. We need young women. We need folks that have different perspectives to run for office. And look, it's difficult. And I understand as a first-time candidate that a lot of times you're running against folks that have political machines and war chests and, and built-in votes, and it seems almost unsurmountable that you'd be able to do this. But the one thing that we have in our side and in our, in our perspective is the fact that we're authentic. We keep it real. We've had real life experiences. And the more we're vulnerable and honest about that, that's what folks are going to connect with. And that's what folks are going to want to support. And we are that generation that knows how to use media, that knows how to use social media, that doesn't need to be filtered behind consultant campaigns that are going to make you sit there on a couch and look awkward like Ted Cruz. You know, we're able to speak directly to folks. We're able to talk about the things that maybe other candidates haven't talked about in the past because we've had sets of experiences that are real. You know, I've been working since I was 14 years old and I've had all sorts of jobs. And a lot of jobs that, you know, as a waitress, as a model, as a live mannequin, as in a clothing store, this aren't the typical kind of jobs that politicians have had in their life. But that's why it's important. Because when I go to Washington, I represent the real experience of everyone in this district. And I think that that's what we need right now. And so I encourage you not only to vote, but to consider running for office. Thank you so much. Alejandra Capoverdi is running to represent the 34th district in California. You guys can go out and vote for her on April 4th. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys.